Well, it looks like I'm live. Hi, everybody. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you don't see inside my bedroom. There, that's better. Uh, welcome to Tying Monday. And uh, now I see my autofocus isn't working, but good enough. It'll 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 soften my wrinkles. So anyway, here we are. Monday, we're going to tie a fly. Um, who's going to tie along with me today? Who's going to brave this pattern with me? I don't see any. I don't see. Nobody's here, Julia. No. Oh, Roger's here. Um, oh, there we go. Ed's here. Carmine's here. Mark is here. So who's going to tie along with me? Who's going to who's going to tie this pattern? Who wants to tie today? Who is brave enough? Brave enough to tie this thing. I'll be tying once I get home from work. Oh, Dustin, you're you're watching this from work. We won't we won't tell your boss. Um, and I'm really I'm really curious. Um, who's here for the first time? If you've never if you've never been to one of our live tying sessions, just um, just uh, put a comment put a comment in the uh, in the comments. Because uh, it would be uh, cool to see uh, if there's any new people. I, mean, I see a lot of familiar faces, but um, I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious who who's new, who hasn't been here before. So uh, as you as you come in, just uh, say, "Oh, first time for me," and we can welcome you. Um, I'm just curious, no other reason. And uh, today. We are going to tie a Grand Slam crab, and um, yes, it it has caught Grand Slams before, which is a um, permit bonefish and tarpon in the same day in the same water. Um, and then there there is also there's also a Super Slam, which some people throw in a snook, some people throw in a redfish, some people throw in a mutton snapper. Uh, this fly will catch all of those species. There, there aren't many things in salt water that won't eat a crab. Um, crabs are preferred food. Even, even big, big tarpon uh, won't pass up a crab if it's swimming in open water and they come upon it. So uh, crab flies are, are uh, just amazing patterns. Uh, you fish them a little bit differently than you do your normal uh, streamer patterns because uh, crabs usually just scoot away from the bottom and then they drop back to the bottom. They're, they're secure play unless they're spawning. Sometimes when you have a crab spawn, when they're migrating, they'll be floating in, in mid water, uh, towards the surface. Most of the time when they're disturbed, they scoot up from the bottom and then they drop back in that defensive posture with, with the claws behind them. And, uh, the most, uh, opportune time for a crab fly is when it's sinking, it's on the sink. That's what fish see when a crab is trying to get away. It, it, it sinks toward the bottom. So the idea with fishing a crab fly for the most part is not to, not to throw it in front of a fish and, and twitch it, but to have it dropping as the fish comes upon it. And of course then uh, it, it might hit the bottom and, and then you might give it an occasional twitch or a hop uh, along the bottom, uh, but uh, you don't often want to swim a crab fly like you would an, another fly. So um, it's a different, a di little bit different presentation. Um, but uh, again, lots of things eat crabs, and this is a, a kind of a. I think it's a fun fly to tie, and um, it uses uh, a um, a method of both getting a weighted keel and uh, making the fly rattle. And I think it's a really uh, clever and innovative way of, of putting uh, both weight and a rattle into a fly. Um, you know, if you've tied with rattles at all, because rattles seem to be effective on certain flies for, for uh, freshwater bass and sometimes for trout and definitely for saltwater species because um, crayfish and crabs and shrimp and things click. Uh, when they swim, and that that can sometimes alert a fish that there's a prey item around that little clicking. But the trouble with rat the rattles that you see, 
uh, the kind they put in in spinning lures and things like that are little glass tubes with uh, with uh, BB shot in them, little lead lead or uh, metal balls, and they're really uh, clunky. Uh, if you tie a fly with a rattle, you have to have a big bulbous body, and the glass often breaks if you hit your fly on a rock or if you hit it on your rod tip or something. The rattles break, uh, so they're they're a real pain to use, and they're not very practical. Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink here. This way of making rattles, uh, and rattles don't weigh that much, so they don't add much weight to a fly, um, the glass rattles. But this way of, um, here, I'll show you the fly. This way of uh, making a rattle and a keel on a fly uses a piece of monofilament and some beads. And um, it makes the fly, obviously, ride hook side up because it, acts like a keel. And if you twitch this fly or just as it sinks, those little beads will, will, will rattle. Um, so it's a, it's a really effective fly. I've caught a lot of bonefish on this fly. Uh, I don't think I've caught any permit on it, but I plan on, uh, uh trying it, uh, this spring for a permit. And I know it would catch tarpon and, uh, I've caught redfish and sea trout on this pattern as well, or speckled trout. So, um, anyway, it is, a um, it's a cool pattern and um, uses some um, different techniques that uh, it uses the same kind of yarn technique that you would use to tie a um, merkin crab or uh, Aaron Adams bastard crab. Uh, lots of crab patterns use this uh, use this uh, method of of tying yarn uh, on the fly sideways. So anyway, I'll show you some tricks to doing that. Show you how the keel is built and I honestly think that um this this keeling idea has a lot of application in in trout patterns and in bass patterns um it uh i, I think it's got a lot of potential i'm surprised we don't see it in more flies so maybe some of you can experiment with it uh mike uh, i like size four for bonefish uh, you could tie it in a six as well um you're gonna have to Get some little tiny beads, but you could tie it in a six. I wouldn't go that. I wouldn't go any smaller than a six. But I, I find that four is uh, that four is is about right. And Mark, absolutely, it's going to ride upside down. Absolutely, it's going to ride upside down. That's what you want if you're fishing a fly on the bottom or close to the bottom. You want that hook point up. So yes, it will ride. It will ride upside down which is the way you want most uh, most flies that you fish on the flats to ride. All right, so I don't see anybody that's new. I guess we don't have any new people today. No, I don't, Julia, did you see anybody? Oh, Julia's back, by the way. Say hi, Julia. Hi, everybody. I missed you all. Hope you're Julia having a great on, holiday season. Julia was on vacation last week, so I know that you're all... Glad to see your smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's tie one of these suckers. What do you think? You guys all ready? Let's go. So I'm going to start with, um, you could use any uh, kind of standard shank, um, standard shank saltwater hook. I'm using the standard Orvis uh, pre -sar sharpen saltwater hook in a size two. Uh, because I'm going to fish these for permit, I want a little bit bigger pattern. Because if I were tying this for bonefish, I might use twos if they were, like if I was in the Bahamas uh, where there's some a lot of big bonefish or Florida Keys, I might use a two. But uh, for for bonefish, a four. And a two would, two would be fine for redfish as well. I use a two for uh, striped bass. This is a really good striped bass pattern because striped bass eat a lot of crabs when they're in shallow water. So I'm going to take that finished fly out and put in my size two saltwater hook. You could use that black bonefish hook that I like too, the Gamagatsu black bonefish hook on this pattern. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is put our eyes on here. And 
the the pattern that you see in the Orvis catalog has um, bead chain eye, uh, silver bead chain, and you can use bead chain eye. I want to make this fly uh, relatively heavy because I'm going to fish it for permit and striped bass probably, and um, they they tend to uh, be in a little bit deeper water, and you need you may need to sink it quicker. Um, for bonefish, you probably want to stick with bead eyes, um, uh, bead chain eye, because uh, they're in shallower water. And as I said, you want the fish to catch it on the way down. So you don't want it to sink too quickly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use these white uh, solid metal eyes. Oh, I got to attach my thread. And I'm going to make, this is going to be a tan crab. And you probably want to match the, um, match the thread to your your body color and I didn't have any I didn't have any tan thread in the in 60 which is what I'm using so I'm using yellow and it looks fine it it, it uh, blends into the body pretty well you could use white too or you know or you could use a contrasting color if you want you could use a chartreuse or a pink color just for a for a contrasting color so I'm going to place these eyes at a little and I'm going to just a little bit back from the eye of the hook probably an eye length, and I'm going to um, go across a bunch of times, and then I'm going to re reposition that eye and cross the other way. And you want to take a fair number of turns here. You want to build up that thread so that covers the whole shank of that eye so it doesn't slip. And then once I get that, I'm going to go around the base. You don't want to depend on a, a glue to hold this in place. You can put some super glue or something, but when you put those eyes in there, you don't want them to wiggle even before you put any glue on it. And I can put, I can put some glue on at the end, so I'm not worried at this point. So those are in there tight. I can't wiggle those. That's what you want to see. And then come back a little bit from the eye and take some crystal flash. Not too many strands, maybe four, five, just a small amount. And wet the whole bunch. And just lay this so that you know they extend about a hook gap beyond the uh, beyond the end of the hook and i like to um i like to take a, a couple turns maybe three or four turns and i keep this long because now i've got um now i've got uh, a piece for tying the next fly if i wet it it stays together then i i don't have to uh I don't have to worry about finding a new bunch of crystal flash. And then I'll hold this up and pull it toward me a little bit so that it stays on top of the hook shank. And then I'll go down the bend a little bit. And it, you can stagger those. They don't have to all be the same length. These are going to be the little, uh, little antennae, little tiny legs or antennae of the crab. So that's set. Next thing I'm going to do is take a uh, grizzly hackle cape and I'm going to use some of the feathers up, up high in the cape that you don't normally use for anything except maybe streamers. Not good dry fly hackle. And these are going to be the claws. So I'm going to come in about in the center of the uh, feather and just snip them both off somewhere about the same spot. Those are going to be my claws. And then, you know, that's about a good, that's about a good claw size there. And I'll strip the rest of the fibers off that. So now I got one claw. And just 
And these claws don't have to be exactly the same because crabs don't always have symmetrical claws. Sometimes one claw is bigger than the other. Oftentimes one claw is bigger than the other. Cut that off. So now I got my two claws. And I will take the first claw and hold it on the far side. And I will kind of pull it this way toward me for a couple turns because I want that claw to kind of stick out like so. And then I'll come back and take the other claw and push that over against the far side so that it, you know, so they kind of splay apart like so. That looks good. So I got a couple claws there and then I'll wind forward on top of the hook or wherever. You can see that's not going the way I want it to go. If the claws don't, if your claws don't, separate the way you want them to you can come around and take a little take a little turn of thread behind them now they're separated better and then wind forward you can be pretty sloppy here this is all going to get bound under so it doesn't matter cut the stems just make sure that you bind those down so they don't come out later and end up there. Any questions so far, Julia? We don't have any questions. No. Wow. I know. Everyone's just uh, engaged in your time. Huh. Either there or they're asleep. Right. Now I'm going to take a piece of 20-pound mono. You could use 25. You could use 18. Just a piece of relatively heavy monofilament. Cut it off. Pretty long piece at this point. Uh, you can always cut it back. And then I like to take a pair of little pliers and just squeeze that in a couple places. Leave a little gap in between those squeezes. Give Just give it a little kind of a serration. That's going to help hold it in place. You don't want this thing to come off when you're fishing. And then I'm going to, did I switch cameras? Yep. I'm going to tie that down nice and securely to the top of the hook. So I'm going to pull it a little bit toward me. And I'm going to go back, you know, with, with nice even turns. So this thing is never going to pull out. All the way back to the claws. And just leave it. You can stick it behind your vise or in your material clip or whatever. <clears throat> I'm going to stick it in my material clip to keep it out of the way. And it won't stay in the material clip. That's okay. doesn't matter. All right. Now I'm going to turn my fly upside down. And I'm going to readjust the camera a little bit. The reason I'm turning my fly upside down is that when you tie these body segments in, the bottom part is going to, the thread's going to show through. It's not going to show through as much on the top. And crabs are segmented on the bottom, not so much on the top. They're pretty smooth on the top. Um, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, but if you, know, if you want to make this thing more realistic, then you put your segments on the bottom. And it's not that much harder doing it upside down. So now I'm going to take some EP fiber in tan. And you can use, um, you can use any kind of yarn you want. They used to use uh, Aunt Lydia's rug yarn for the, the Merkin. I think most people use EP fiber now. But you can use, you can use any kind of any kind of yarn. It should be um, fairly lightweight and um, 
it shouldn't hold water. So wool wouldn't be the greatest thing in the world. Um, this stuff sheds water so that when you pick up your fly and cast it, it's not going to be so heavy because crab flies uh, are pretty air resistant and they're pretty heavy. And so uh, they tend to be hard to cast. And I'm going to take a, you know, a kind of a standard size, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a little bit less than a hook gap in diameter when it's not, when it's not uh, compressed like that. And I'm going to cut a long piece off and I'll probably have to actually go to another piece. You use quite a bit of yarn on this fly. And then I'm just going to cut myself not too big of a piece. Maybe, I don't know, an inch, a little over an inch. And I'm going to roll it in my fingers a little bit. This, this helps you to tie these sections in. And it's not so important on this first one, but it's going to be more important. Oh, God, I didn't switch cameras. I'm sorry. Nobody told me. There's the... There's the EP fiber. Guy's got to tell me when I forget to switch cameras. So that's the little length of EP fiber that I've got. Now I know everybody's asleep because nobody told me to switch cameras. Then I'm going to take this bunch of yarn and find the midpoint and carefully this first turn go around the hook and take a couple turns like so that's going to be your near side and then fold this piece oh no going to take this other piece and you're going to hold it and wind around the top and you don't have to take many turns here because we're going to bind this down and uh, we're going to put some glue on here. And then, so you've got, you've got uh, yarn on both sides of the hook and then just come back and wind over it a little bit. And don't worry if there's some stray fibers in there, they're going to disappear. So you got, now you've got, you know, two, it's got a flat, got a flat piece of yarn on the hook. Now you're going to come back and I'll show you it. I will switch cameras this time. Take another bunch, about the same length. Cut it. Roll it in your fingers. Now it's going to become more apparent why you want to roll that in your fingers. Because it gets a little trickier. So I'm going to, again, find the midpoint. I'm going to go across and take a couple of turns there and then i'm gonna bring my thumb here so that i can use my thumb as a guide and go over the top and get to that far side without getting into the other fibers and line it up take a couple of nice tight turns you can still straighten it out here. And then I'm going to do the same thing again. No questions? I don't believe it. Everybody must be asleep today. We had a couple questions, but they are ones that I could answer. We did have one question that um, I couldn't answer from Mark. He's asking what kind of scissors you use or you're using. These are called, these are called copter scissors. The brand is Copter. Mm. I think they're either German or Italian. Let me see if I can see it here. They're made in Italy. Hairline. Hairline sells them. If, a, if your fly, local fly shop carries Hairline products, um, they'll have, they may have Copter scissors. So I'm going to, again, tie another bunch in. Get it there, and then I'm going to find this, try to separate that piece from what I did before, put my thumb there, 
And by using my thumb as a guide, I'm not going to bind under the stuff that I already put in place. And then wind back to lock it in place. Now it's time for some rubber legs. And I would advise you, even though you're going to have to cut a lot of this away, I would advise you to use a full length of a rubber leg. So when it comes on the, when it comes from the bunch, cut the whole length off. It's going to make this fly a lot easier uh, to trim and to manipulate later. Okay, so Tom, full... we, have, we have a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, Roger's asking if it is easier to make all of the small EP body pieces first. Before you put in the rubber legs? I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I, I wish I knew a way, but um, and uh, I don't think so. Matt's asking, would grizzly from a bugger pack have suitable claw feathers? Yeah, you can use any grizzly feather, really. Um, you know, you could use a partridge feather. You could use a hen feather. Um, any, old, any old feather really will work. You certainly don't have to use a grizzly feather. Yeah, I meant, that's a good point. I, I meant to uh, say something about that, that you can use any old feather. Doesn't matter at all. You might find a better feather than the grizzly hackle. All right, so I'm going to fold this rubber leg in the middle around my thread. Bring it in there. Wind back to the sections. And then I'm just going to split these. One of these will want to tend to go to one side and one will want to go to the other. And then I'll just hold them in place and wind back over them to lock them in place. So now they're both sticking out to the side. And they don't have to, you know, they don't have to be symmetrical or anything at this point every once in a while check everything to make sure it's flat now i'm going to tie in another piece of ep fiber so i'm gonna gonna get a piece of this i'm going to roll it i'm gonna come back i'll switch cameras and now it gets a little trickier, but it's not that bad because those those rubber legs being long are going to hang down and they're not they're not going to get in the way as much as you might think. And then I'm going to find that that part and use my thumb as a guide to kind of block it away from the rest of the body. Come forward. Those didn't go in so well, but the thing is, you can just push them back and wind over them to get them to stick out straight. And now another rubber leg. I'm gonna put three sets of rubber legs in here. So I'll grab another one. Fold it over. Bring it down in there. Wind a couple times. Separate them. Where'd that other one go? There it is. Is that the right one? Oh no. Uh, <laughs> they were all right, still we have another we have another question. Yeah. Uh, Zachariah is asking, will you trim the EP fibers once you get all the segments in? They're wondering how precise you want to be with measuring out the fibers before time. Yes, Zachariah, be patient. We are <laughs> gonna trim it. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely going to, I'm just trying to see where this rubber leg is. There we go. Uh, yeah. So you don't have to be very precise. The answer is you don't want to, you know, you don't want to make it too long because you want to waste a lot of it, but you want it to be shorter than your rubber legs because it makes it easier to trim at the end. And you, cause you notice I'm not measuring that precisely with these segments. And cut another piece. Oops. Didn't switch cameras. Cut another piece. <laughs> Roll it in my fingers. 
Now it starts to get a little tricky, but still not that bad. And I can push that far side back, get in there. I'm going to pull these a little bit. And then again, use my thumb as a guide. That's a little short, but I think it's still going to be enough. It's a little tricky uh, getting in with the camera in the way here. And then one more rubber leg, I think. What about, yeah, I got two. One, one more set of rubber legs. You could just put two if you want. I like three. I think a crab has more legs than that, but... Three seems about right. Fold it over my thread, bring it in, lock it down, pull them apart. Wind back over to lock them in place. That looks all right. Now it's EP fiber all the way down. Now I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna just modify this leg a little bit. I don't quite like the way it's going. This is not something you really need to worry about unless you're fussy like me. Okay, so more EP fiber. And it looks like I got one more strand I'm going to have to cut myself another piece because this last piece is getting kind of scraggly. Roll it. Tie it in. Use my thumb as a guide, push them back, wind over them. Hmm, got a little gap in there, but that's probably gonna be fixed. All right, now I gotta, I'm gonna get I'm going to have to get another section of EP fiber and um, this will be also the fiber for the start of another fly when I tie the next one. I'm not tying the next one today. Not, you, not for you guys. Okay. Okay. A couple more questions. Okay. Wade's asking, what do you use for the beads for the rattle? That's a good question. <laughs> but it's a secret. No, just kidding. Uh, you, can use, uh, you can use regular um, brass beads mm -hmm. or you can use tungsten bead. Okay. Depends on how, how heavy you want the fly to be. Tungsten beads are expensive. So you might not want to use, you might want to use standard brass beads, um, but I want this thing to really sink and tungsten's heavier. Mm. So I'm going to use tungsten on this fly. Um, and what other colors of EP, EP fiber can you use? Mark's asking. Well, it depends on the, you know, the crabs that you see. A lot of crabs that you see, especially on sand flats, are tan but they can be olivey. I would say tan and olive are probably the two most common colors. You could also alternate colors to get a banded effect. Uh, they do, that's the way the, uh, the merkin fly is tied. So you could do that. But um, tan and olive are probably the two most common. You might, uh, you know, if you're imitating a blue crab, uh, the claws and the legs on a blue crab are blue. They're quite common crab. Um, so you might want to use a blue 
feather, a blue grizzly feather, or just a blue feather for the claws, and uh, blue rubber legs for the legs, and then kind of an olivey tan body, because that's a, that's the way a blue crab looks. And if you want to get really fancy, you could paint the tips of that um, that crab the claws red, because blue crabs have red tip claws. But that's fancier than I want to get. Okay, so body is done. I'm going to come forward up to the eye and, and forget about that thread for a while. And then I'm going to take uh, some sort of dubbing brush, a piece of Velcro, a comb, or whatever, and I'm going to comb these fibers out. And what that's going to do, am I on the right camera? Yeah. What that's going to do is it's going to uh, kind of mold those fibers together. You could even turn it upside down and get the other side too. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to find all those legs. Now this, you can see now why I wanted to make those legs so long. And I'm going to pull all the legs down. Make sure you got six of them. <laughs> I see where I kind of missed a spot in there. Oh, well, doesn't matter. And let me actually use the other camera for this part. How's that better? Now you've got all those rubber legs hanging down there. Um, you can use a can use a uh, one of these little clamps, or you could use a pair of hackle pliers, or just a, you know any small clamp, and clamp on those long fibers, and then just let it hang. That's going to keep them out of the way as you trim this fly. And then pull your fibers up. Make sure they're all. Make sure they're not caught under there. Yeah. And then I even like to brush it again. Good enough. And then you're going to trim this. First of all, you probably want to trim anything that's in front of the eyes. And then I just kind of use the eyes as a guide and cut an oval shape. And as you get back toward the rear, toward those claws, you want to kind of hold on to them to make sure you don't cut your claws away. And then I do the near side, same way. Try to be symmetrical. Although, again, it's not, I already am not symmetrical, I can see. So I'm gonna have to shorten up my other side. So I'm gonna make this shorter so it matches. And then, you know, trim it, trim it flat a little bit. This is going to be the top side of your fly. Then you can let go of your rubber legs, bring them into position, kind of work them into those fibers, trim them off as long or as, as short as you want. I eyeball them. There's people that, that you know, line them up on top of the fly um to make sure they're perfectly even but they don't have to be it's not necessary and then you might want to trim now trim the bottom a little bit 
to get a nice flat shape. There. So that's what uh, that's what your crab looks like at this point. I have a little gap in there. Not going to matter. Uh, and next, oh, I know what I'm going to do next. Next, I am going to put some epoxy on those. Before I put that keel in, I'm going to take some uh, thin UV cure epoxy, the real thin stuff, so that it soaks into the thread and, and the fibers. We'll get some on the eyes there. And then hit it with my UV light. You don't want these to fall apart because it's kind of a complicated fly. Now I'm going to bring it right side up and I'm going to thread. I like five beads on this and I forgot what size they were. I'm going to actually measure these beads because everybody's going to want to know what size bead I have on there. So I'm going to measure one. Um, Mark's asking to change your camera, but you're just getting a bead, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm doing it off camera, Mark. Just like that. Tom, Wade's asking if, uh, some mono eyes would benefit the fly. Sure, why not? <laughs> uh, they're three mil. I'm using three millimeter beads on here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take, and I'm going to use white beads because the carapace on these things usually has a white uh, color. So I'm going to use, you can buy white tungsten beads. That's what I'm using. But you again, you can use any beads you want, whatever you have handy. They're mainly for weight and to make the thing rattle. So I'm going to get five of these. Ooh, got more than that. Oh, well. And I am going to thread them on that monofilament. So I'm just going to one by one and they'll stay. If your piece of monofilament is long enough, they'll, they'll just stay there. So you don't have to worry about it. And I don't know of any easier way to do it than thread them on one at a time. Somebody else may have a clever way of doing it, like using a needle threader or something, but this works. None of this fly is quick and easy. Sorry, I bumped the camera there. Is it still in focus? I can't see. Yeah, looks like it. And what do we got? Four. Yeah, I like five beads. You could use three. You could use two. You could use six. Whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. And you could use any color you want to. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna fold this forward to where I want it to be, which is like that. You don't want it to stick up too much, but you want to have some freedom of movement of those beads. And I'm going to mark that spot and just take my little needle nose pliers again and crimp this a little bit a few times. And I'll go to the other camera and I'm going to thread this through the eye 
and start a little bit tighter, start to wind it. Get it in place, wind all the way back. Nice, really super tight turns here. And then I like to actually fold this over and bind it down again. You don't want this thing coming off in the middle of fishing. So folding it over like that is gonna really prevent it from coming out and then cut that mono. Whip finish. Tom, we can't see you, you got a blackout. Oh my God. I don't know what happened there. See it now? Nope. We can hear you. There you are. Oh, yeah. And it faded back. Oh, I know what happened. I I bumped the. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sorry. I, I bumped I bumped the cable out of the camera. So any uh, what what did what did they miss? Just the folding. What what was missing there? Just yeah, the it just folding. went out for like thirty seconds. Okay, okay. And then um, a whip finish. If I can find my whip finish tool, there it is. Put another hit of epoxy on the head. Make sure the beads are out of the way. You don't want to glue those in place because you want those to move. Cure the epoxy. Make sure that that's centered. And there you go. Grand Slam Crab. Here, let me turn it down a little bit so you can see it. There we go. So it's going to ride, definitely ride hook side up. And these beads are going to keel it. And they're also going to rattle a little bit. Very subtle. Very subtle rattle. So that is the Grand Slam Crab. More questions? More questions? Are you allergic to the UV? No, not that I know of, Wade. So far, so good. Uh, yes, Harold, I, I threaded the mono through the hook eye and then um, wound back over it. And then I folded it back one more time towards the eye and wound over it one more time. So it's really locked in place so that it doesn't come out. Crimping it helps too, but I want to make sure because um, you don't, you don't want that weight to, you don't want that weight to come out. Um, yeah, Mike, if you tie these for Christmas Island, make sure you tie them really small. Six is no bigger than six is because those, those bonefish like smaller flies there. So um, you want some little ones. What other questions? Any other questions? Have I missed any, Julia? No, I think you got all of them. It looks great. Wow, I see black screen, black screen, fade to black, lost camera. Oh my god, an emergency! Now the battery did. The battery won't give out on this camera. I have I have this hooked up to four four uh, very powerful batteries, so I could tie for a couple hours, be, probably about five hours before the battery would go out on this one. So I'm I'm pretty well set up for for battery power. And the other the other cameras on AC power, so uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're we're not going to have any battery problems here. 
All right, everyone. Well, again, is there anybody that's new before before you go? Um, is there if there's anybody that's new, just shout shout out that you're the uh, the that you're new here. We want to welcome you to uh, Fly Tying Monday, and uh, it's always great to great to uh, I won't say see new faces, but see new names in the comments. Um, when you say drop. Does that mean you are constantly casting? No, Mark, what, what you would, would do with this fly is you would see a permit or a bonefish coming. Um, it, it's going to be sight fishing uh, or a redfish for that matter. And uh, there's a first timer, Dale Dickinson. Welcome, Dale. Um, and you would throw this fly. The first thing you want to do when you, when you get out on the flats is to drop the fly in the water and see how fast it sinks. You, you want to know the sink rate of this fly. That tells you how much to lead the fish by because you want this thing kind of, you know, just almost hitting the bottom when the fish gets about this close to it. That's the, that's the best. So, um, so you're not constantly casting. You're waiting till you see a fish, and you're waiting for that moment that you can cast that fly at a particular distance, depending on the depth of the water, so that that fly is just sinking uh, to the fish's level when it swims by. And the fish are always moving on the flats. So um, you do have to, you do, there's a lot of angles and you do have to pay attention and there's a lot of geometry involved <laughs> in that. But if you get it all right, uh, it might, might work. It'll work on a bowfish. Will, will it work on a permit? Nobody knows. That's all up to the permit. They're not very predictable. Uh, will you be online through the month or taking some family time for a break? Well, William, it's only one day a week, and I am going on a trip in uh, late January, early February, where I won't be tying for a couple of weeks. But other than that, boy, I'm frozen. Other than that, um, I'll, I'll be doing it right through the holidays. Julie and I will be here, and I will I will be taking family time, but not on Mondays. I couldn't I couldn't miss a Monday with you guys. That would be that would be awful. I'd miss you so much. I wouldn't know what to do with my Monday. Oh no, you just froze, Tom. I know. I know. As long as I keep moving my head, it won't freeze, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's like a shark. Yeah, so I have to keep I have to keep moving my head. Anyway, um, thank you all for for tuning in today. It really means a lot to us that you're here and that you keep us company and keep us honest. And your questions are awesome. Keep your questions coming. Um, we love to help. Love to help you get better with your fly tying and have more fun doing it. So, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next Monday. What are we tying next Monday? I forgot. Do you have a Julia, what is it? Julia, what is it? Tell us, Julia. Hawkins Hat Trick Streamer. Oh, Hawkins Hat Trick Streamer. Yeah, good trout streamer. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. Bye, everyone.